welcome. Uh, my name is Laura Thompson. I have been at Mozilla for like five years now. Um, I've deployed a lot of stuff and I have made a lot of mistakes. And one of the things I always would like people to take away from my talk is that you should make different mistakes from the ones that I made. Make your own new novel mistakes rather than repeating the things that I have done incorrectly. <laughs> so, so I'm going to talk about deployment. Uh, okay, so a few disclaimers. Well, it's not on the slide, is the slides are ugly, I apologize. This is not about tools. I'm not going to get up here and talk about, you know, fabric or something. Um, it's not prescriptive because I don't really believe in prescriptive advice anymore. Like, there is one true way to do deployment, and that is the only thing that will work for you. That's garbage, right? There's a toolkit, and you've got to find tools that work for you and work them into the way that you do things. Um, part of what this talk is about is kind of recognizing where you are along the deployment spectrum and working out where you want to be and working out how to get there. So that's kind of the, the goal at the end of the day. I'm going to start with the more academic and work my way through to the more practical. So I'm going to begin by talking about models. Who here has a computer science degree? I'm going to give you horrible flashbacks. <laughs> so sometime during your computer science degree, or sometime later if you did a project management course or something, someone may have talked to you about the software capability maturity model, which came out of Carnegie Mellon. It's developed, I think, in the 80s. If you do any kind of MBA, they'll talk about this as well. Um, <clears throat> and there are, have been developed since then several different capability maturity models. Like there's one for QA, um, <clears throat> but there isn't one for deployment. The idea of a capability maturity model, it says whenever you have a process for doing something, there are different stages of development through that process, right? At the start, you don't really know what you're doing, and then as you get better, there are particular characteristics of stages in this process. So. The software development one looks like this, and I think it also applies to deployment. So at the beginning of the day, when you first start deploying things, uh, there's a stage called initial. And in that stage, we expect processes to be chaotic, people to have to do individual heroics and stay up all night. Um, second stage is repeatable, which means that you wrote down something about how to do it, so you can try and do it the same way the next time. Um, third step is defined, which is you have kind of a standard process, and you're starting to tune it to be a little bit better. Um, a managed process is measured, like the meaning of management is to, to measure stuff. And finally, optimizing, actually, and as, just as someone who likes to write, I really find the, uh, the verb structure here really distressing. Um, <coughs> oh, it feels like it should be optimized, but I guess optimizing means that you are continuing to make it better as time goes on. So let me talk about those a little bit more um, <coughs> in the context of deployment. So this kind of initial phase is the startup phase of many projects. We are starting a new company and we're going to make this product. Um, or I have like a personal web app and some open source project, whatever it is. Um, this is the startup phase, and it can be a really long period of time spent, although it's called initial, right? Like you might, you might stay in this phase forever. There are people who work at companies that have been in this phase for 10 years. Um, <clears throat> this means that you push code whenever you feel like it, um, whenever it's done, right? Uh, devs push code, you probably don't have any sysadmins involved. And you probably don't have like a, a lot of tests, possibly zero. Uh, no automation, everything's done manually, no verification that when you push stuff other than like loading a page and say, yeah, it kind of looks okay. Some people in this phase, although we've gotten better about this, some people don't use any source control. Um, I think the, the great thing of GitHub is it's like source control for the masses. There's no longer any excuse not to use source control on a project. Um, okay, so that's the initial phase. <coughs> and then you've been doing it for a while. Let's say you start to get a few more users, right? And this starts to be a little bit painful. Um, and you move to what's called a repeatable deployment model. This typically takes place after you've pushed out your, like, your MVP or your 1.0 version of product, your first non-beta ship, <coughs> or the first time you have to ship something, say you got mentioned on Hacker News or Reddit or something, and suddenly you actually have a significant number of users, which means you have a significant number of complaints when you screw something up. So <coughs> what typically happens here is you want to be able to do it in a repeatable way. You'll typically start writing down a process, like these are the, the five steps that we do when we ship. Um, and the thing that's kind of interesting is you start to deploy less often, right? When you first started, you wrote some code and you pushed it up to production. You wrote some code and you pushed it up to production. At this point, you like wait till a whole feature is done and you maybe spend some time testing it before you push it out. <coughs> so you actually slow down. It's kind of interesting. Um, then we get into the define process. A lot of people stick here and never get past this particular step in the process. This is where you have some documentation. You start to have some automation. 
Um, <clears throat> maybe you have some tests that have to pass before you're allowed to deploy a build. Um, and it's particularly with startups, this is often the point where you hire somebody to do this for you, right? Unless, unless you mean that you're not like religiously no ops or something. Um, <clears throat> or one of the developers starts to become more of a sysadmin because it annoys them this is not being done properly. Right, like that's the that classic model here. Um, and I would say, like, there's lots of big companies that do this way. Like, lots of people, lots of places I have worked, lots of places I've consulted to, never really get past this point, right? They might have, like, one or two admins, or they might even have a whole team of admins. They have a little bit of documentation, but they really don't have any, like, automated tests or continuous integration or anything like that to make this, like, a, a fancy way of doing things. By the time you get to a managed process, <coughs> you should have automation. So when I check in code, tests should be getting run. Um, I might have some kind of packaging, some sort of actual like deployment system to push the build out to different machines in the network. And this, <clears throat> the need for doing that tends to happen somewhere between repeatable and managed, because it tends to be the point where you stop having a small countable number of, of servers, right? Like you can deploy code to three servers by hand. When you have 100 servers, you don't want to be deploying code, you code to each one by hand, like you have to automate it, right? It just becomes a, a matter of scale. <coughs> in a managed process too, you should do some kind of verification after you've released code. And ideally, you can go all Etsy on this and say, how often do we push? How many times a day do we deploy? How long does it take? When we deploy, how many requests per second were we doing before and after? This is where you start having like iPads taped up on the cubicle wall above people's desks, showing you the, um, <coughs> which is what we actually do with them, um, showing like how things are going, number of commits, what happened to performance. Finally, <coughs> you should achieve a state of nirvana, you know, on the, the top of the sort of zen pyramid of uh, <coughs> developer deployment. It should be easy. Often at the stage you're doing continuous deployment, you have a lot of automation. <coughs> it's very lightweight, so I can deploy by just sort of like thinking about it. Um, I shouldn't have to invest a lot of time or effort, and it shouldn't be something that scares me. I think one thing that's characteristic of the early, sta early stages is that deployments are a little bit scary. You might be going to stay up really late to do it. You know, you're a little bit frightened that it might go badly, all that kind of stuff. By this stage, it should be pretty straightforward most of the time. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, allergies. Um, then this is kind of a model that you may have noticed as we were talking about this, is how much do we ship, right? And I don't mean how often we ship, but how much stuff do we ship at a given time? So it's like the deployment velocity, right? Um, <coughs> so typically at the beginning, you start off pushing a patch at a time, then you go out to pushing a feature at a time. Then it becomes like a big heavyweight release and lots of people stick there. We deploy code once every three months. Um, then back to features, then back to per patch pushes as your deployments get easier. So this is kind of like, as the number of users and the complexity goes up, and then as your automation gets better, it goes down. <coughs> so there's a nice diagram of that. Obviously I'm not any <coughs> form of like a graphic designer's little toenail. Um, okay, in terms of sort of the how often you ship, there's a few different models. I'll talk through each of those. And I call them critical mass, deadline, train model, and CD. So the critical mass shipping model is we ship and we've got enough stuff. Like, this doesn't feel like enough stuff to cut a release for. Um, <clears throat> typically, that's sort of like your minimum viable product stuff. And if you don't have any kind of formal schedule around releases like Wednesday, first of the month, whatever it is, um, then this is often the model that you use. <coughs> uh, you might have a single hard deadline. Let's say that you have a marketing department that has said, uh, let's say we're building a massively multiplayer online game and it's going to ship on March the 1st because that's what all the advertising materials have said. And we don't care if it's broken, that's when it ships. Um, hard deadlines are hard and I don't mean that as like a meme joke. But this is actually like the hardest one these things to do because <clears throat> you know all this is always like a death march right like you're always horribly stressed you will hate yourself i really recommend that if you have any say in like how to choose your shipping velocity that you don't choose this <laughs> um sometimes unavoidable right like we see that with the stuff that i work on too because like we know that firefox is going to ship on a particular day and we work on all the tool chain parts right so you need to have tool chain support for this feature that's going to ship on a day and you, not a lot we can do about that. The only thing we've really done to make that easier is gotten better at communicating with Firefox teams. They can say to us, this thing is going to ship on November 15th. And they can tell us three months in advance instead of telling us the day before. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Next thing, train model. Um, 
the sort of we do a couple of projects that I work on right now. Ship every Wednesday or you know every morning or morning and night, um, and whatever's ready to go out at that time ships, and anything else goes out in the next ship. And this is kind of like a different way of thinking about deadlines. And going from like a, a deadline model to a train model reduces developer stress like that. I think it takes a little bit of getting used to because people are like, oh, I have to get this done for Wednesday. And you're like, get it done when it's done. Do it right and then we'll ship it. Um, <clears throat> and once we really absorb that, it's so much easier for people. And then they can sort of focus on doing their best work. OK. And finally, continuous deployment, which is when a change is done, you ship it. I always think continuous is kind of a misnomer, just sort of speaking from a mathematical background. It's actually discrete, right? You're shipping a change set at a time. It's not like code changing constantly. But <clears throat> um, I just wanted to give you that definition there that you know, once a change is done, and that might mean finished coding, it might mean it passed automation, it might mean it's been manually QA'd by a human being, but when it's done, you ship it. Okay, <clears throat> so that's kind of the the pipeline. Now I'm going to talk about the tools and practices that we need to use to move further along um, that maturity model. So, <clears throat> the first thing is source control. And I think that these are the things that I think are important to do with source control. Uh, put up your hand if you are not using Git. Alright, what are you guys using? Subversion. 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 Anything else? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not talking about us. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you said, if you, you, okay, you don't understand the query. The query is if you don't use Git. Are so you I, saying you don't use Git? I know we have everything else. Yes. And you're probably using some Microsoft. Team Foundation Server. Team Foundation oh. Server. Yes. All right. So the good, thing, <laughs> the good thing is, I think that it doesn't actually matter what you use. These comments are biased to Git, but at Mozilla we have at least five version control systems of which I am aware. Uh, Git. Subversion, CVS, VZR, and HG. Um, <clears throat> so these uh, theories can be applied to all of these things to a great lesser extent. I'm sure there's some RCS in there that and, I don't know about. I don't, don't care do to know about. Don't do this to your admins. <clears throat> pick pick <laughs> one fault, and yes, ditch the yes. rest. Yeah. Concurs. Yeah. 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 Don't just pick one. <laughs> yes, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing is, I think that no, so these practices are pretty much true no, no matter what system you're using. You should have at least two branches assuming that you are using something that supports branching. So let's not talk about CVS and RCS. Um, <coughs> and in, in your main repo, right? At one that is stable and one that is unstable. <coughs> and the definition there is that the stable branch should be able to be deployed at any time. Okay? And ideally it should probably be what is deployed, right? And the only time there's a difference between what is deployed and what's in the stable branch um, is when you're about to release it. The unstable branch is where other stuff lands. So if you read much about Git, you will see that there's like a religious war here, like everything in technology. People who say master should be stable, and people who say no, master should be unstable, we should have a stable branch. And those people will fight it out <coughs> in the annals of the internet, and we can just ignore them. It doesn't matter what you call them, you can call them stable and unstable. Um, when you are working on code as an individual developer, I recommend that a good way to do things, the way we do things, is a branch per bug or a branch per feature. Um, <clears throat> and then merge it in when you're ready. So you need some kind of like defined process about how developers are supposed to work with source control, what the branch model is, when they should merge stuff, and so on. So one thing that's really famous is this idea of Git flow. Has anyone not heard of Git flow? Okay, Google it. There's a diagram which explains Git flow, and it looks like a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs. <clears throat> it's one of those things that a, the person who wrote starts off with this easy this disclaimer. Um, Git flow is a simple process that will make your life easier, and then you look at the diagram and it's like, <laughs> no, no it won't. Um, so it's kind of overkill, but you need some sort of simple process. Um, doesn't really matter what it is, come up with something documented and share it. Um, if you are not pushing every single patch that you release, right, like if, if you are patching, if you are pushing every single revision, you don't need to tag. But if you are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, shipping a bunch of um, revisions or patches or whatever together, then you should tag it. And the reason for that is so that you can look back through history and say, um, this is what we had deployed on day X, this is what we had deployed on day Y. And the other reason for it is so that if you have to roll back, you have something that you can easily roll back to. So that you're not taking your stable branch and trying to back stuff out of it <coughs> on the fly when things are horribly burning on fire in production. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to be able to like just flip the switch and go back really easily. 
a side comment to that, even if you are deploying every revision that you make, if you are sharing your code as an open source project, you need to have an extended support release, an ESR. Put up your hand if the code that you work on is shipped as open source, as well as being used by you. Okay, not everybody. <coughs> but if you are, even if it's just like a library that you use, um, people that are going to use it, and everything we do at Mozilla is open source, right? This applies a lot to us. People will be trying to use our code, and if we're shipping it every revision, then they say like, hey, I can't keep up with you guys, what revision should I be running? So it's good to have something where you can say, that version, <coughs> use that version because we know it's pretty stable and whatever. <coughs> and the good thing, by the way, about doing this is, if you make it easier for users to use your open source project, then you will get patches from them and all will be well with the universe. Okay, um, next thing is development environments. Uh, a developer's laptop is a horrible environment in which to develop. Um, <coughs> that's true, I think, even, I've been doing more Python recently and we use a lot of virtual env. Um, even so, it's a horrible environment and it's really easy to mess it up. I think it's actually worse than PHP um, <coughs> because your laptop does not simulate production. Even if you have all the same libraries installed, at the end of the day, your laptop, chances are you're not running, say, RHEL 6, which is what we run in production. Um, <coughs> you know, if you might, be, you might be lucky and have Ubuntu on your laptop and Ubuntu in production, but a lot of people, that's not the case. Um, so one way of dealing this, with this is using a VM. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we have done a lot of work with this and like having, using VirtualBox and Vagrant to script a particular VM. Um, it's hard to maintain that though, right? Like it is hard to keep it up to date um, and have something that's easy to share so that when developers starts on a new day, um, it's easier for them. A lot of these things are hard too. <coughs> the next thing that's really hard is development databases, right? Um, <coughs> if you have a development database that has personally identifying information, um, then it's really hard to share it with developers, right? Um, or if it's really big, it's really hard to get like a meaningful subset of that. And you might have a development database set up, but then if a developer needs to make destructive changes, you have a different problem, right? <coughs> so some of the ways we can do this, um, you can set up a fake data database. It's worth your time writing a script to generate data to fill a database that looks like production data but isn't. Um, you can use a miniature database, which is like an excerpt from production, say the last 30 days of data or whatever. Um, <coughs> the other thing you do, which we've done recently in one of my projects, is um, come up with a development API sandbox. In that particular project, we don't do direct database access. We do it through a middleware API, like a Restian API. Um, so we have actually set up like a public version of this with a database server behind it that has fake data in it. So anybody that wants to hack on the front end can hack on the front end without having to install HBase, um, which is the Hadoop database that takes some effort to set that up. Um, <coughs> the other thing you can do is, um, uh, this is sort of more the vagrant thing, but you can also, you know, on your continuous integration server, have it do in a lightweight fashion, set up and tear down VMs to do testing, right? So that if you're doing something like that, it helps you with this. All of these things kind of feed into each other. <coughs> Finally, I recommend we have kind of a strange system at Mozilla. When it was first brought in, I couldn't really understand why, and I'm like a huge fan of it, which is that we have three environments. Um, we have dev, stage, and production. But the dev server isn't something that you can log into, right? It's a staging server. Um, it's a staging server that runs unstable code. And stage is a staging server that runs stable code. I talked about this two different branches, stable and unstable. So we have a staging environment for each of those. Um, and use it <coughs> Stop me with questions if you haven't, by the way, because I'm doing a lot of stuff. Then we get to the staging environment. Um, put up your hand if you don't have a staging server, staging environment. Yay! Okay, I don't have to take anybody out and kill them. <laughs> <laughs> so the most important thing about your staging environment is that it must reflect production. And I don't mean in a half-hearted way. <coughs> I don't mean writing the same version of the code. I don't mean writing the same version of the operating system. I mean everything. Everything must be the same as far as close as you can make it. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes you can't do everything, right? So let's say your massive social network, blah, and you have a thousand servers, a thousand web heads running a production environment. You probably don't want to have a thousand web heads in staging, right? But same proportions are important. So let's say that in production you have <clears throat> one database and ten web heads. Well, well, let me say two databases and ten web heads. Then in staging, maybe you can have one database and five web heads, right? 
the reason for that is so that you find out where the bottlenecks are at the same time, right? Like when, you, when you're testing stuff, not after you've shipped it. <coughs> so you should think of your staging server as a scale model of production, if you like. You should try and get some realistic traffic and load on it. Um, realistic traffic is harder than realistic load, because it's really easy to simulate load, right? Like you can set up <coughs> AV or anything else, like throw lots of traffic at a web head. But to make it realistic traffic, um, you can replay traffic. There's lots of kind of tools for this. Um, you can use your load balances to like mirror some of your traffic to your staging environment if you're so inclined. Um, <coughs> but it's really important to try and simulate any problems that you might have in production your staging server. And because of that, the staging should be monitored. It shouldn't be the kind of monitoring that <coughs> wakes somebody up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I think it's really important. <laughs> But if you have, let's say we have staged some code and it has, has a query in it that performs horribly and brings the database to its knees, it will be nice to notice that. Like, that it's, you have some problem with your database in staging before you push it to production. Right, yep. Um, <coughs> we, this is a little bit of a plug, but we just released an open source project called Shadow. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it takes your production environment and it <coughs> across to another, and then runs the traffic through both, mm -hmm. and takes the output on the other side and does a dip. Cool. So uh, we use that for our API later now. So that, that's one of the new, new things we've built, it's like three weeks publicly. That sounds really cool, and I will definitely play with that. It's pretty sweet. It's all Python too. Cool. Um, <coughs> the other thing is, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, put up your hand if you don't have managed configuration in your production environment. Good. Who's using Puppet? Cool. And who's using Chef? And who's using something else? What do you use? We're using CloudFormation. Yep. Yeah, Elizabeth, is anything, anything else? You don't want to have something different that you use? <laughs> no, you use a CF engine? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> and there's a Microsoft tool for that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, <clears throat> um, so people are really getting really good about the production. Who uses configuration management in their staging environment? Who doesn't? Okay, good. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Stop that. All right. So I'm going to rant about this because this has bitten me like 47 times, <laughs> possibly more, like I haven't actually counted. Um, but we've all done this. The staging environment is one box and it runs, you know, the database and memcache and the web app and whatever else, bits and pieces, you know, Rabbit, Redis, Mongo, whatever it is, <clears throat> you're running it all on one machine. And then you release it and everything breaks because you had some inherent assumptions in your code or configuration that all of this stuff was running on the same machine. Don't do this. VMs are cheap. Cloud machines are cheap. Even if you only have one physical box, have two VMs on it, or as many as you need. Um, <coughs> I speak from painful experience. <coughs> okay, um, I'm gonna talk about continuous integration. Put up your hand if you are not using continuous integration. I don't know what that is. <coughs> you don't know what that is. That's because you're a DBA. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's fair, right? Like, um, so the idea of continuous integration is that <coughs> we are continuously learning code, and when we do, we run tests on it. So let me tell you a little bit about the environment that we use, because I'm really happy with it. Um, we use Git. When we commit something to GitHub, we use Jenkins. Jenkins notices that we have committed something to GitHub, and it pulls down the source code, <coughs> and it creates a build, and it sets up some VMs, and it runs all the tests and says yes. And if it says yes, then it pushes that build to the development server. So it does all of that automatically. Um, <clears throat> the, thing, the other thing that does that I have to talk about now, which is really, really clever because we just brought this in, is there a thing called Leroy, which is a plugin for Jenkins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and what that actually does, it will actually uh, run tests on pull requests on GitHub. So when you put in a pull request, the repo it will actually pull down the code and run all the tests and say, tests will pass on this if it is merged or not which is like super, super awesome, by the way, because it's just like in huge laziness factor awesome. Um, <clears throat> you know, it saves you a lot of trouble with reviewing. If somebody's checking in basically broken code, if it says, well, this is not gonna run in our production environment, you don't have to waste time co like checking it out and installing it and reading the code to figure out what they broke so you can write an intelligent review. If their pull request fails, tests in Leroy, then you're just like, ba -ba, I'm try again. <laughs> <clears throat> try builds are really important. Um, so we build and commit, we run all the unit tests, and we auto push the build to, actually we do this with our unstable branch to development and with our stable branch to staging. 
then we actually run more tests on it, which is kind of weird. It's kind of a historical Mozilla thing, um, <clears throat> but I'm not unhappy with it. This is Jenkins runs Jenkins runs all the unit tests, and then we have um, a QA team, and they have their own Jenkins instance, which runs a whole bunch of Selenium tests on the front end, and we don't release them unless both those sets of tests um, pass. I think there is a plan to like merge these two Jenkins instances, but sort of organic, which is why it hasn't happened yet. So that's kind of a. <coughs> Which two Jenkins CI and the QA internal one. Yeah. Yep. Yes, that's your job. No, not mine anymore. But <laughs> not your job anymore? Yes. Oh, okay. It'll happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's our continuous integration model. model. If you don't have, um, don't want to set all this stuff up yourself, you can use Travis. It's really nice. I, I recommend the use of Travis to do this kind of stuff for you. TravisCI.org, I think. Okay, so testing wise, these are the things that I think you should test before you deploy. Um, <coughs> you should run your unit tests locally before you check in, um, and you run them on build. One of the other things we did with our Git repo is we have um, a lot of it's Python, and you'd find that a lot of people doing code review where they would look at something that had someone put a pull request and say, oh hey, the code works, but it's not PEP8 compliant, which is the, the coding standard, right? Um, <coughs> so it'd be rejected. And now we actually built that into our commit book. You can't commit the code unless it's PEP8 compliant, which is really a nice to okay, so run the tests locally, run them on the build, run some user or exceptions testing against the browser, manual test if you have like human power to do that with. <coughs> load testing is important, not for every change, but for every feature that you think might affect load, right? If you're doing something new and tricky for database. And I want to make a distinguishing thing between load tests and smoke tests. So a load test is how does this look under production load? Smoke test is uh, what's the maximum load that this build will cope with? And you don't do that every day, right? Like you do it <coughs> when you're pushing out a new feature because it gives you an idea of like capacity planning and stuff. Okay, so when you actually have got this build and it passes all the tests and it's all beautiful and been mostly automated to here, you should deploy it. And it doesn't really matter what you use even to do deployment, but it should really be automated. Um, there are a million different tools and all of them are good. Um, well, some of them probably aren't, but I haven't used any of the bad ones. One of the important things is that you should deploy the same way to staging as you do to production. Um, and you should use configuration management to deploy config changes the same way in staging and production. I think I'm spring pitching for converted here a little bit. Um, <coughs> QA wise, we do feature testing on the unstable branch. So I landed this new feature, we're going to test it on the unstable version, then we run a full set of tests on staging, then we deploy it, then we run a full set of tests on production, which is called verification. That's just making sure you don't screw anything up in the interim. Um, okay, so measurement. We have a lot of monitoring, um, which is done mostly using Nagios. We have started adding some like dev level monitoring as well using Graphite. Um, <coughs> and the reason for that is to give us kind of better insight about how our code changes affect performance. Um, monitoring is more like a, I think a lot of times, like more of a binary thing, like this is broken or it's not. Um, <clears throat> whereas our kind of like the dev level monitoring is about are we degrading performance in such a way that if we continue with this trend that things will go to hell. Um, performance testing. So as I said, we're starting to have some dashboards around the place that show like look what your commit did to the build now it performs like this instead of like this. Um, you should instrument as much as you can. You know, graph everything. If, if, there, is not, if there is not a graph of it, it doesn't exist. Um, <clears throat> measure everything, instrument everything. And then people ask the question, oh, ask the question, is it actually possible to have too much data? And the answer is yes, but only if you're not doing anything with it, right? Like if you have insight into your data and know what it means, then it is worthwhile to collect it. I think it's okay to collect, it's okay to be a little bit of a data hoarder, right? <clears throat> it's okay to collect stuff not knowing what you're gonna do with it yet. Um, because sometimes digging through the data, you can find insights that you didn't previously have. Um, main thing is to allow resources for somebody to dig into this stuff, right? Like it's insufficient to collect it and never look at it and have no plans to, um, to mine it. Okay, after you've deployed something major, you should have a post-mortem. Um, <clears throat> I think people with more project management backgrounds than me like to believe a post-project review. Um, I like to call it a post-mortem because, you know, it's really important to have a post-mortem even if things go well. But I think that the two things that you want to think about are <coughs> what went right and what went wrong. But the what went wrong shouldn't be, this was all your fault. It should be talking about like the stuff, not the people, right? Like what things 
should have been done differently for next time. And it's really important to have a finger pointing. And there's also some things like, <coughs> you might say, oh, for this release we made a checklist and that worked really well, so we'll do that again. Right. So. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about when things do go wrong, as they do. This is the only picture in my presentation. That's the definition of DevOps, right? Yeah, that's the definition of DevOps. <laughs> This is me as a five year old. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I stole this from Eric Kastner, who used to be at Etsy, now he's at Kickstarter. Um, this is the idea of a quantum of deployment. <clears throat> what is the smallest number of steps with the smallest number of people and the smallest amount of ceremony, I like goat sacrifice, blah, 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 whatever, um, required to get new code right in your servers? Because <clears throat> when you have a disaster of some kind, chances are you're going to have to do this. So you want to make deployment easy so that when things go wrong and you have to change stuff in a hurry, that you can do it with a minimum of fuss and ceremony. Because when the building is on fire, that is not the time you want to be figuring this stuff out. <clears throat> okay. At Mozilla we call it a chem spill. Um, I'll have to explain why in a minute. But even if you have like a heavyweight non-automated deployment, even if you only deploy every like three or six months and it's all heavyweight and manual, you need to say to yourself, <coughs> if we had an emergency, we had like a gaping security hole, hackers came in and installed a rootkit on the site, what would we do in that event? Like you need to think about what would be our plan, how quickly could we deploy code to fix that? The reason we call it a chem spell, we used to call them fire drills like everybody else. And then the point is really that it's not a drill, <laughs> right? A fire drill is where you will like file out of the building and go and have a cup of coffee and come back in when somebody turns the siren off. A chem spill, you know, like there's green toxic stuff bubbling on the ground here and you need to do something about it now. So that's why the change of terminology. So there are some concepts around this. <clears throat> there's a very popular, I wouldn't call it a meme, but it's a meme in the serious sense of meme as opposed to lolcat, um, that failing forward is better than rolling back, right? Uh, to define failing forward for you, it's the premise that the key metric in this stuff is the mean time to repair, not the mean time between failures. So typically people will measure the mean time between failures, like how long between things going horribly wrong in production. Um, <coughs> mean time to repair is more important, right? Like the code is broken, how long it takes to push a fix. Um, I have had people say to me, I would be deeply ashamed if I ever had to roll back code that I had written. And I think those people just haven't been at it long enough. <laughs> so failing forward is great. However, sometimes you can't. So you need to have a plan to fail forward, but you also need to think about rolling back. So I'll give you some examples of when you can't fail forward. Examples of that are things like a, an intractable performance problem, right? Um, which, yes, you should pick up in staging, but people make mistakes. This is the key thing here. Um, you might have some kind of a hardware failure. Um, Let's say that you put some new machines into production with some new caching solution on them and they all catch on fire on the first day. This is not sort of a joke. Um, data center migration. So one of the biggest projects that I've worked on at Mozilla was migrating um, a Hadoop cluster and all its surrounding things from um, a crafty old data center to a shiny new data center. And I say that really, <laughs> like genuinely. Um, you know, onto all new hardware with Puppet, which you didn't have before, um, <coughs> and proper monitoring, all this kind of stuff. So this is kind of one of those things. If we had migrated to the new data center and we had an intractable problem for a system that has to have very high uptime requirements, we wouldn't necessarily be able to try and fix it very long. Like if we were losing data, we knew we were going to have to roll back to the previous data center. That's an example. Um, another thing too is an, you might have an upper time limit. If you are trying to fail forward, but you are losing millions of dollars per minute, you might have to roll back instead. Because you might have like the CEO <laughs> screaming down the phone in your ear saying, do you know how much money we've lost in the last 30 minutes and you guys are not coding fast enough. Okay. So, <clears throat> rolling back is going back to the last known good. I talked about why you should tag your code, this is why. Um, having a known process for rollback is just as important as having a known process for deployment. You should practice rollback like you practice failover. And if you don't practice failover, you should practice that too. <laughs> um, you should know how you're going to do this. It's really simple. Um, one of the worst experiences in my professional career was when we had to roll back release after 72 hours of dropping data on the floor. 
Um, and one of the reasons that we left it so long was because we thought that rolling back would be harder. And then it turned out that actually it was really easy. If we had known how to do that, we'd have done it much sooner um, and people would have been much less unhappy. So have a written procedure for rollbacks and know how to roll back. When you're doing any of these kinds of complicated deployments, like those straightforward ones, it's usually when you need a rollback plan, not like pushing out a change to an HTML template, but when you are like adding infrastructure um, or like sort of um, irreversibly changing the way your app works. Um, it's really good to have a written plan, right? Like a checklist with steps and people who are responsible for stuff. Um, you should also have a checklist for your rollback. And in your going forward plan, you should know when you're going to give up. Right. Um, you should define some decision points. <clears throat> so before shipping, things like if we pass this test or performance criteria, then we will ship. Um, if these things go wrong, we'll roll back. When we used to have um, more heavyweight deployments, we had a rule that if we had one major strike or three minor strikes, we would roll back. Um, and you make these rules beforehand. Because when you are in the middle of fighting fires, you don't want to be making meta decisions. Um, <clears throat> like you don't want to be thinking about process when you're in the middle of a disaster because you can't like it just it consumes mental bandwidth that you should be focusing on solving the problem um, <clears throat> so talk about the stuff beforehand you might talk about it in the postmortem of your previous release and lay down some rules about how you're going to do things and what you're going to do in the event of a disaster um, <clears throat> and then you won't be having an argument about it right like you'll be in this disaster and someone will be going we should roll back and the other person goes, no, we shouldn't roll back. And then this person can say, but the rules say if we have this kind of failure, then we roll back, and we have this kind of failure, so we're going to roll back. And we can just not kill each other. So, so a better thing than rollbacks um, is to add feature flagging or feature switching to your app, right? Um, so rather than, and this can't be done for everything, right? Like there are some places, I think particularly if you have like the kind of uh, irreversible destructive database changes, the example where feature switches don't work terribly well. Um, often you have two choices about how to implement something though. You can implement it with feature flagging or feature switching in a more complicated way than you would have done it if you weren't going to use feature flagging or feature switching. So there's overhead involved in building stuff this way. But it's overhead that will make your life easier, right? It's like writing unit tests makes the code take longer, but it's worth it. Um, adding feature flagging is very similar. So the idea of feature flagging is that you can turn a feature on for a subset of users, right? I might say I'm going to show this to 10% of my users for two days, and then I'm going to look at the metrics and then make it relate to everybody. Um, <clears throat> you can just turn it on for everybody. And the other thing you can do is that if you have feature switching or flagging for everything on your website, then you can turn off non essential features if you have a surge in load, right? Like to save your database or whatever. Um, think of it as load shedding. It's what the electric company does. If they have like a supply problem, they start switching off the unimportant customers. Um, actually, I did that in Manhattan pretty recently. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so you just want to be able to have control. Control is awesome. This kind of stuff. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about continuous deployment. Um, usually when people go to a deployment talk, they think that it's going to be all about continuous deployment. Um, so I'm going to talk about it for the last five minutes or so. So what is continuous deployment? It's a misnomer. It's discrete. Also, in most cases when people are deploying continuously, first of all, it's per change, not continuous. Um, but it's usually automated, not automatic. And by that I mean most continuous deployment systems that I have seen are not commit code, have it run in production automatically, but commit code and then push a button, like a single action to have it deployed to production, right? Call it the big red button. Um, <clears throat> but usually it requires like a decision by a human being. And I think that's a good thing, right? So I think that's something worth bearing in mind if you are building yourself a continuous deployment setup. Um, and the intention of this is push per change, and typically have a, a red button. Okay, so I want to talk about the, the things that you need to have in place before you can go to continuous deployment, right? We've been thinking about this a lot, and I think there's kind of like a, a set of criteria. There are two slides of this. First one is technical requirements, and the other one is like social and process requirements. So, in order to go to continuous deployment, obviously you need to have continuous integration, right? If people aren't like landing code and having it tested all the time, there's no way that you can actually deploy it. You need to have good test coverage. Um, so I haven't said 100% test coverage because I'm kind of a cynic about that. Um, you can test every single line of code, it's awesome. But honestly, like 90% code coverage is probably okay most of the time. I think it is better to have 90% unit test coverage and some user acceptance tests and some load tests and some integration tests than 100% unit coverage 
and a huge sense of false confidence, right? Because unit tests don't cover everything. Um, and people get to feel like, I have 100% unit test coverage. My code is 100% perfect. You are wrong. It could be really <laughs> slow is like the classic example, right? Um, so you need to know, I think the mo most important thing is not so much having good tests, but knowing what the limitations of your tests are, right? Like having a really good feel for what the holes are, because when you know the holes, then you know the risks. Um, <clears throat> you need to have a staging environment that reflects production. You need to have managed configuration. And you need to have some kind of scripted single button deployment to all of the machines in your infrastructure. The social aspects is that you really need to have a high level of trust. Right? Um, this is not something you can get overnight. Um, this is kind of, doesn't really matter what your developer versus ops setup is, right? But everybody that's working on this need to get along. Um, you cannot do this in a weekend by all going like tingling in the Rockies or something. Um, it takes time. And the main thing with trust is like having people be honest, say like, no, I can't do that now because X. Um, <clears throat> you know, being able to say no. Um, and just sometimes just a little bit of time. A certain degree of like openness to the culture. A lot has been written about that. But I recommend not embarking on continuous deployment with people that you don't like. Because it's not going to work for you. Um, <clears throat> you need to have a realistic assessment of the level of risk involved with your process. Like you might say, okay, there's a pretty high risk that we're going to break stuff, but we're a startup, we have 200 users and we don't care, really care if we break stuff, we can just fail forward. But you might say, we're a bank. We have a requirement for five nines. Um, maybe continuous deployment is not for us. Uh, you need to have excellent code review. This is a lot of the time about looking for performance problems and security problems and stuff like that. You need to be really good at source code management so you can fix stuff if you break it. And you should have lots of tracking and trending and monitoring. Another thing you hear about a lot in the context of continuous deployment is that testing is monitoring. Right. It's kind of an interesting idea, so let me talk about this. You should absolutely run your tests against production. The question is, though, if you is there any reason that you shouldn't run your tests continuously? If they don't break anything, if they don't cause excessive load, then you probably should. Um, it's a kind of monitoring. There are, again, sort of people who are really religious about this and saying, I run my test suite against production, so I don't need any other kind of monitoring. That's absolutely untrue. Um, because your test suite and your monitoring measure different things, or they should, right? Like your testing will tell you when something is already broken. Um, or broken particular way, or tell you about things like business logic being broken. Um, like nobody can buy stuff on the site would be a thing that you would get from your monitoring. Um, disk is filling up on the database survey, something you'd get from Nagios. Right, so you're, you're looking at different things. Um, and it's okay to have overlap between those two things. If you have you know, multiple data points about a problem, it lets you triangulate or figure out what the root cause is more easily. So, two final messages that I want to leave you with from this talk. You might say continuous deployment is not for me. I do not have the risk tolerance for it. You know, we're, do we're doing high, we're working in a high trading environment or a hospital, and I don't want to deploy code continuously in case I kill someone or bankrupt a bank. Um, but I think that it is worth these things that I talked about, like the checklist items, the technical stuff, and the social stuff. It's worth building out those things, even if you don't want to do continuous deployment. Because automation and a good tool chain and a fine process and high levels of trust, all of these things will make your working life a lot easier. So the message is build the capability for continuous deployment, even if you don't ever intend to deploy continuously. And the second thing, which is um, one of the arguments for going to like a high velocity deployment environment or continuous deployment, is that really, like with anything else, right? Mm -hmm. The only really good way, the only way to get really good at this is to do it a lot. If you only deploy once every six months, it's always going to be hard because it's going to be unfamiliar to you. If you do it once a day, multiple times a day, once a week, it becomes like a, a routine and something that you can do almost without thinking about it. You absorb it into your subconscious and then you can just focus on the parts that are hard as opposed to the parts that are routine, using up a lot of your mental bandwidth. <sighs> so that's it. Questions? If you, yes. So I have to I'm say, in, in the last, <laughs> last two years, at least yeah. thinking of Socorro, your, yeah. your deployment process mm -hmm. has improved immensely. Oh, out of like, sight, yes. Like uh -huh. in the last two years from now and, and today, it's yeah. just night and day. And, and from my perspective, that's a lot to do with everything that you covered yeah. in your presentation. What was, what, in your opinion, what would be like the most influential The one most that, important that, thing? Yeah. Um, part of that predictability, which actually covers a lot of things. 
Um, but it covers like automation and practice, I think are the two main things that it covers. Like knowing what's going to happen because you've tested it um, and done it a lot, I think. We used to, I mean, you know, there were times when on this project and on previous projects I worked on too, like when I worked on Sumo, um, you know, when we had a deployment, we'd order in dinner and we'd sit down there at seven o'clock to a deployment. We'd be <laughs> expecting to be there till two in the morning, right? Um, and now it's like, <laughs> we deploy in the middle of a meeting a lot of the time. Like, oh, can we deploy now? Yeah, okay, let's deploy. That's it. Um, like, it's just no fuss. Um, we only do it once a week, but it's like, a, yeah, let's do that. And then we update a wiki, but we're going to automate that. <laughs> we have a, one of building a release tool to automate like a, um, a wiki so we know what versions are like on what servers and stuff. It's the last piece, I think. Other questions? Yes. This is kind of random, but um, for those who don't do continuous integration, so they still check on things through build and there's not an automated test. Mm -hmm. um, and how yep. Do you think it is a good practice or no to have some kind of, I think at every single dev team I've ever worked yeah. on, there's been some negative consequence for breaking the build. If you're yes. the person breaking mm -hmm. the build, you have a skeleton one on your door or something like that. The dunce hat. Right, right. right. Yep. <laughs> good practice or bad practice? Oh yeah, I love it. Um, I, I think, you know, developer shaming is a powerful tool. Um, it depends a little bit on the person, actually, we're talking about this at lunchtime, because I, it depends on your culture, right? There are some people who get, would get utterly mortified by that, and it would probably just completely destroy their productivity for the rest of the day. Um, so I think as long as it's jovial, it's okay. Um, you know, like having a hub bot or something that pops up in IRC and says, hey, you broke the bill, I think that's okay. Taking it to the extreme of like hazing and okay, now you have to run around the room with no pants on. It's like, <laughs> um, but um, it depends on the team. You know, I think some teams have kind of like a sorry, use a cliche, a bro culture, right? Where it's all like oh, we're all gonna like poke fun at each other, and you're an idiot. Look what look what you did in the code. I can't believe you committed that, you moron. And then other places are like a little nicer. So it's a little bit knowing your company culture. <laughs> um, you know, and I I know among there's ten people on my team, and I know there are some developers where I could like. Especially like if the ego is huge, then you need to shame them a little bit. Like, <laughs> I thought you were this big developer and you never made those mistakes. And there are other people, and I know if I said that to them, they would be crushed. Right? And it's more like, hey, maybe you should pay a little more attention next time. You know, I try to be nice about it. So it depends. Just to add on to that, yeah. or a funny side of it. Uh, think me has a toy, which is a USB powered rocket launcher. Yes. <laughs> Someone actually wrote a plugin to Jenkins mm -hmm. to fire the rocket launcher at the guy who. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and we actually spent some time getting it to work, but the damn launcher needed some Windows stuff, and we were like, we don't have time for this. Oh, you shit. should get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the I was on the show, I was like, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> that was totally not intended. Great, great. Honestly. Just slipped out. Yeah. I mean, dude, Can't take you anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the jet lag. Best excuse. He did Best excuse ever. Any other questions? Definitely so. Well, thank you for listening to me ramble. <laughs>
won't offend us. Uh, now we won't invite you to our green <laughs> Ready to go whenever. Oh, rock on. Yeah. All right. That's good. Yeah, I do this professionally. So. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Keith Casey. I'm here to talk about uh, project triage and recovery. Um, it was funny. Last night I had dinner with my uncle, and he's like, So, what are you in town for? And I said, Oh, I'm, I'm speaking at a tech conference. He's like, Can you give me like an overview? But I, and he's not in tech, so he's like, I'm not really going to understand what you're talking about. I'm like, well, actually, you're an EMT, so you know exactly what we're talking about. Does everyone know what an EMT is? They're the guys who get out of the ambulance and help people out. And their whole job is about triaging. It's about looking at the situation, seeing what's going on, seeing are, you know, are there open sucking wounds? Is this guy bleeding out? Is there head trauma? You know, what's going on? And figuring out what can we actually address here? What actually requires uh, transportation to a hospital? Um, you know, what requires just stabilization? You know, we can't fix it, but we can at least prevent it from getting worse. Um, so when I actually said, yes, you'll get it, and I explained this to him, he goes, oh yeah, I could do that. <laughs> okay, maybe not, but um, it, was, it was really kind of funny to sort of like have that connection with a family member, because I still get the thing of, hey, can you set my DVD player? Um, so anyway, I'm Keith Casey. Um, I have a variety of number of jobs. It's mostly to keep me out of the house because uh, my wife gets tired of me pretty quickly. Uh, but my primary job is actually I'm a developer evangelist for Twilio. Is everyone familiar with Twilio? Who's not familiar with Twilio? Cal Evans. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> uh, three, okay. Uh, Twilio, real simply, is a platform for plugging applications into the telephone network. So if you want to send text messages, uh, make phone calls, or receive and react to phone calls and text messages, use us. We integrate with just about everything out there. Any CRM sort of thing, IVR, um, we run on like all the major platforms. We're a Microsoft partner for Azure. We, we're all over the place. Um, but my whole job as a developer evangelist is I get to roam around the countryside. I give presentations. I do a lot of demos. I do a lot of stuff that looks a little bit like sales engineering. I hang out with customers, see what they're doing, see what problems they're having. Um, it's a blast. I love my job. So, But uh, that's not what this presentation is about. So this presentation is about um, web to project Is anyone familiar with web to project OK, everyone who I've talked uh, everyone who's seen versions of this presentation before. Awesome. Um, web to project is a web-based project management system. Um, as of this week, is today the 8th or the 9th? The 8th. 8th. So as of tomorrow, it'll be five years old. Um, we forked from another project called Dot Project. And it sort of reached a point where there was a lot of sort of inertia around the project. And we reached the point where we said, hey, look, um, in order to make progress, we need to stop and figure out what we're doing. There's nothing's happening here. So there were seven of us on the team, I think, at that point. And the team lead said, I have an idea. We're going to restart from scratch. Yeah. So in November 2007, that team went that way and restarted from scratch. And they said it would take nine months to get to version 1.0 release. <laughs> we all know how rewrites go. They're, they're, they're still working on it. Uh, but in the meantime, what, we took a different approach. We said, look, uh, we've got thousands and thousands of users on the system. If we rewrite from scratch, we're losing all these lessons learned. That said, the code base is a piece of shit. How do we make this better? How do we actually sort of take where we are now and turn it into something useful? So our approach was, instead of restarting from, uh, from scratch, we're going to go through and refactor the whole thing. And we are, like I said, five years in, and there's still more work to do. Um, but what's funny is, just as a little sidebar about myself, this is what I do, and this is what a lot of people know me as. Well, what's funny is more and more I'm getting known for something else. I have a contentious relationship with the TSA. Um, yeah, you, I'm probably on lists. Let me just leave it there. Um, this is being recorded, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you want to talk about that, we'll do it off camera later. <laughs> I don't want to have any evidence. That just seems like a bad thing. Um, but I have, I'm happy to chat about this one over drinks or whatever tonight. And I've got some stories. <laughs> All right, so uh, at a higher level, not just within web to project the reason I'm talking about this is because the vast majority of projects fail. Now, fail is kind of one of those squishy words. Like, when we think of fail, we think of test failing. It's green or it's red. You know, it's a very binary thing. It's, it's pass or fail. There's no sort of middle ground. When you talk about fail in this sense of the word, though, their definition of fail, and this was from a Gartner study a few years ago, 
um, their definition of fill was anything that was, um, let's see, more than 5% over budget, more than I forget how many weeks it was late, or didn't live up to expectations of the customers. Has anyone built any project that was on time, on budget, and satisfied all the customers? <laughs> Cal. <laughs> <laughs> I want to yeah. build stuff for myself. Yeah, then I'm totally satisfied. Okay, okay, yeah. So, has anyone built something for somebody else that fits all three of those? I mean, the vast majority of the time, the answer is no. So their 95% thing seems pretty reasonable. Um, and while that sounds, while that's bad, fundamentally it's not always damaging to the teams. Because, you know, if you miss a deadline by a couple of days, it might not be a big thing. Unless you're launching the game on March 1st and you have to hit that deadline. You know, there's not always a bad thing. But more than, more likely than not, it's going to damage the team in some way. Whether it's a death march to get there, whether um, you end up adding new people to the team at the last minute, you know, all those sorts of things that go along with a project that's late or over budget or just not satisfying the customers, it damages the team. Um, but we were talking earlier about, you know, those sorts of things in, a, in an environment where, you know, there's actually money on the table. You know, there, there's actual customers. People are paying money to use the software, to build on it or whatever. Um, it's open source, it's, it's kind of worse in that regard because at the end of the day, if somebody makes a commitment to an open source project, I'm going to do this. If they don't do that, I mean, what happens? There's no consequences, which I think is mostly a good thing, but at the same time, projects don't spectacularly fail most of the time. They just sort of die out in a whimper. You know, they, people just go their separate directions and everything like that. So everything I talk about here um, is based on our open source project. Not everything will be applicable to every team. So I'm just throwing that out there, just right off the bat. When I first gave this presentation, they're like, oh, you're talking about open source software. I run a commercial software company. I'm like, yes, but you have teams, right? All the same stuff applies, or most of it, enough. All right, so a little bit of background just on uh, Dot Project itself. This was um, five years ago today, before Webber Project existed. This was the project we forked from, Dot Project. Um, had a lot of problems. Um, Small budget was a, is an understatement, it had no budget. We were selling um, t-shirts and ad space to basically cover our hosting costs, that was about it. Um, circa 2007, Dot Project had about seven contributors, 200,000 lines of code. Some of it dated back literally 10 years. It was from PHP 3, 4 time frames. Um, in fact, I was just doing some more cleanup on a couple things and I found if uh, PHP version greater than three, <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I just deleted that. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's probably not all that important anymore. Um, and at that point in 2007, version 3.0 of Dot Project had been underway for about two and a half, three years, and it just wasn't getting sort of the traction to sort of close that gap. Uh, so there was there were some good things. The project worked. It had a pretty big community, um, eight, nine thousand um, active users, that sort of thing. Uh, but it had some pretty fundamental problems to it. So, like I said earlier, the, uh, the initial idea was to scratch it all. You know, just start from scratch, trying to do everything from the ground up. And fundamentally, when we talk about those as software developers, it sounds kind of appealing, right? You're like, oh, wow, I get to start with fresh and new, and I learned all these things since I did it last time, so it'll be that much better. Uh, there's actually a phrase called that, called, um, that covers that called second system syndrome. Is anyone familiar with that? It's when you build the first version of something and you realize how much it sucks. And all software sucks, let me just throw that out. But then you go to build the second version, you're like, I learned everything last time, now I'm gonna make it perfect. And it isn't. But let's just say it, it still sucks, it just sucks in new and creative ways. Uh, because, you know, fundamentally, you think everyone else's code is junk. You think, you might even think your code from, you know, three months ago or six months ago or 12 months ago is junk too. And the new code is always better. No, it's not. Let's, let's just get that right out. No, it's not. It's not necessarily because there might be a reason why that code was structured the way it was before. Um, the other big reason why re rewriting from the ground up always seems appealing is we get to use the new shiny. Um, I actually had somebody pitch me, hey, we should we build, rebuild web to project in Node. <laughs> like, yeah, let me know how that goes. You know, it seems like a great idea. Hey, it's this new shiny cool project. But you know what? There's so much that went into actually building that to just poured it over is never a clean, fun, entertaining experience. Well, it might be entertaining for me, who's not writing the code, but not for <coughs> people actually doing it. Um, so the problem this runs into fundamentally is that uh, like stuff not knowing what you're going to do with it yet. Um, 
because sometimes digging through the data you can find insights that you didn't previously have. Um, main thing is to allow resources for somebody to dig into this stuff, right? Like it's insufficient to collect it and never look at it and have no plans to, um, to mine it. Okay, after you have deployed something major, you should have a postmortem. Um, <clears throat> I think people with more project management backgrounds than me like to believe a post-project review. Um, I like to call it a postmortem because you know, it's really important to have a postmortem, even if things go well. But I think the, the two things that you want to think about are <coughs> what went right and what went wrong. But the what went wrong shouldn't be, this was all your fault. It should be talking about, like, the stuff, not the people, right? Like, what things should have been done differently for next time. And it's really important to have a finger pointing. And there's also some things like, <coughs> you might say, oh, for this release we made a checklist, and that worked really well, so we'll do that again. Right. So. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about when things do go wrong, as they do. This is the only picture in my presentation. That's the definition of DevOps, right? Yeah, that's the definition of DevOps. <laughs> this is me as a five year old. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I stole this from Eric Kastner, who used to be at Etsy, now he's at Kickstarter. Um, this is the idea of a quantum of deployment. <clears throat> what is the smallest number of steps with the smallest number of people and the smallest amount of ceremony, I like go sacrifice, blah, 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 whatever, um, required to get new code ranked on your servers? Because <clears throat> when you have a disaster of some kind, chances are you're going to have to do this. So you want to make deployment easy so that when things go wrong and you have to change stuff in a hurry, that you can do it with a minimum of fuss and ceremony. Because when the building is on fire, that is not the time you want to be figuring this stuff out. <clears throat> okay. At Mozilla, we call it a chem spill. Um, I'll have to explain why in a minute. But even if you have like a heavyweight non-automated deployment, even if you only deploy every like three or six months and it's all heavyweight and manual, you need to say to yourself, <clears throat> if we had an emergency, we had like a gaping security hole, hackers came in and installed a rootkit on the site, what would we do in that event? Like you need to think about what would be our plan, how quickly could we deploy code to fix that? The reason we call it a chem spell, we used to call them fire drills like everybody else. And then the point is really that it's not a drill, right? A fire drill is where you all like file out of the building and go and have a cup of coffee and come back in when somebody turns the siren off. A chem spill, you know, like there's green toxic stuff bubbling on the ground here and you need to do something about it now. So that's why the change of terminology. So there are some concepts around this. <clears throat> there's a very popular, I wouldn't call it a meme, but it's a meme in the serious sense of meme as opposed to lolcat. Um, that failing forward is better than rolling back, right? Uh, to define failing forward for you, it's the premise that the key metric in this stuff is the mean time to repair, not the mean time between failures. So typically people will measure the mean time between failures, like how long between things going horribly wrong in production. Um, <clears throat> Mean time to repair is more important, right? Like the code is broken, how long does it take to push a fix? Um, I have had people say to me, I would be deeply ashamed if I ever had to roll back code that I had written. And I think those people just haven't been at it long enough. <laughs> <laughs> so failing forward is great. However, sometimes you can't. So you need to have a plan to fail forward, but you also need to think about rolling back. So I'll give you some examples of when you can't fail forward. Examples of that are things like uh, an intractable performance problem, right? Um, which, yes, you should fix up in staging, but people make mistakes. This is the key thing here. Um, you might have some kind of a hardware failure. Um, let's say that you put some new machines into production with some new caching solution on them, and they all catch on fire on the first day. It's not sort of a joke. Um, data center <laughs> migration. So one of the biggest projects that I've worked on at Mozilla was migrating um, a Hadoop cluster and all its surrounding things from um, a crafty old data center to a shiny new data center. And I say that really, <laughs> like genuinely. Um, you know, onto all new hardware with Puppet, which you didn't have before, um, <clears throat> and proper monitoring, all this kind of stuff. So this is kind of one of those things. If we had migrated to the new data center and we had an intractable problem for a system that has to have very high uptime requirements, wouldn't necessarily be able to try and fix it very long. Like if we were losing data, we knew we were going to have to roll back to the previous data center. That's an example. Um, another thing too is an, you might have an upper time limit. If you are trying to fail forward, 
but you are losing millions of dollars per minute, you might have to roll back instead. Because you might have like the CEO <laughs> screaming down the phone in your ear saying, do you know how much money we've lost in the last 30 minutes and you guys are not coding fast enough. Okay. So, <clears throat> rolling back is going back to the last known good. I talked about why you should tag your code, this is why. Um, having a known process for rollback is just as important as having a known process for deployment. You should practice rollback like you practice failover. And if you don't practice failover, you should practice that too. <laughs> um, you should know how you're going to do this. It's really simple. Um, one of the worst experiences in my professional career was when we had to roll back release after 72 hours of dropping data on the floor. Um, and one of the reasons that we left it so long was because we thought that rolling back would be harder. And then it turned out that it actually was really easy. If we had known how to do that, we would have done it much sooner um, and people would be much less unhappy. So have a written procedure for rollbacks and know how to roll back. When you're doing any of these kinds of complicated deployments, like not a straightforward one, it's usually when you need a rollback plan, not like pushing out a change to an HTML template, but when you are like adding infrastructure um, or like sort of um, <laughs> irreversibly changing the way your app works. Um, it's really good to have a written plan, right? Like a checklist with steps and people who are responsible for stuff. Um, you should also have a checklist for your rollback. And in your going forward plan, you should know when you're going to give up, right? Um, you should define some decision points. <clears throat> so before shipping, things like, if we pass this test or performance criteria, then we will ship. Um, if these things go wrong, we'll roll back. When we used to have um, more heavyweight deployments, we had a rule that if we had one major strike or three minor strikes, we would roll back. Um, and you make these rules beforehand. Because when you are in the middle of fighting fires, you don't want to be making meta decisions. Um, <clears throat> like, you don't want to be thinking about process when you're in the middle of a disaster. Because you can't. Like, it just it consumes mental bandwidth that you should be focusing on solving the problem. Um, <clears throat> so talk about the stuff beforehand. You might talk about it in the postmortem of your previous release and lay down some rules about how you're going to do things and what you're going to do in the event of a disaster. Um, <clears throat> and then you won't be having an argument about it, right? Like you'll be in this disaster and someone will be going, we should roll back. And the other person will go, no, we shouldn't roll back. And then this person can say, but the rules say if we have this kind of failure, then we roll back and we have this kind of failure, so we're going to roll back. And we can just not kill each other. So, so a better thing than rollbacks, um, is to add feature flagging or feature switching to your app, right? Um, so rather than, this can't be done for everything, right? Like there are some places, I think particularly if you have like the kind of uh, irreversible destructive database changes, the example where feature switches don't work terribly well. Um, often you have two choices about how to implement something though. You can implement it with feature flagging or feature switching in a more complicated way than you would have done it if you weren't going to use feature flagging or feature switching. So there's overhead involved in building stuff this way but it's overhead that will make your life easier, right? It's like writing unit tests makes the code take longer, but it's worth it. Um, adding feature flagging is very similar. So the idea of feature flagging is that you can turn a feature on for a subset of users, right? I might say, I'm gonna show this to 10% of my users for two days, and then I'm gonna look at the metrics and then make it relate to everybody. Um, <clears throat> you can just turn it on for everybody. And the other thing you can do is that if you have feature switching or flagging for everything on your website, then you can turn off non-essential features if you have a surge in load, right? Like to save your database or whatever. Um, think of it as load shedding. It's what the electric company does. If they have like a supply problem, they start switching off the unimportant customers. Um, actually, they did that in Manhattan pretty recently. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so you just want to be able to have control. Control is awesome. This kind of stuff. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about continuous deployment. Um, usually when people go to a deployment talk, they think that it's going to be all about continuous deployment. Um, so I will talk about it for the last five minutes or so. So what is continuous deployment? It's a misnomer. It's discrete. Also, in most cases when people are deploying continuously, first of all, it's per change, not continuous. Um, but it's usually automated, not automatic. And by that I mean most continuous deployment systems that I have seen are not commit code, have it run in production automatically, but commit code and then push a button, like a single action to have it deployed to production, right? <coughs> what the big red button. Um, <clears throat> but usually it requires like a decision by a human being. And I think that's a good thing, right? So I think that's something worth bearing in mind if you are building yourself a continuous deployment setup. Um, and the intention of this is push per change and typically have a, a red button. Okay. 
So I want to talk about the, the things that you need to have in place before you can go to continuous deployment, right? We've been thinking about this a lot, and I think there's kind of like a, a set of criteria. There are two slides of this. First one is technical requirements, and the other one is like social and process requirements. So in order to go to continuous deployment, obviously you need to have continuous integration, right? If people aren't like landing code and having it tested all the time, there's no way that you can actually deploy it continuously. You need to have good test coverage. Um, so I haven't said 100% test coverage because I'm kind of a cynic about that. Um, you can test every single line of code, it's awesome. But honestly, like 90% code coverage is probably okay most of the time. I think it is better to have 90% unit test coverage and some user acceptance tests and some load tests and some integration tests than 100% unit coverage and a huge sense of false confidence, right? Because unit tests don't cover everything. Um, and people get to feel like, I have 100% unit test coverage. My code is 100% perfect. You are wrong. It could be really <laughs> slow is like the classic example, right? Um, so you need to know, I think the mo most important thing is not so much having good tests, but knowing what the limitations of your tests are, right? Like having a really good feel for what the holes are, because when you know the holes, then you know the risks. Um, <clears throat> you need to have a staging environment that reflects production. You need to have managed configuration. And you need to have some kind of scripted single button deployment to all of the machines in your infrastructure. The social aspects is that you really need to have a high level of trust. Right. Um, this is not something you can get overnight. Um, this is kind of, doesn't really matter what your developer versus ops setup is, right? But everybody that's working on this need to get along. Um, you cannot do this in a weekend by all going like tingling in the Rockies or something. Um, it takes time. And the main thing with trust is like having people be honest, say like, no, I can't do that now because X. Um, <clears throat> you know, being able to say no. Um, and just sometimes just a little bit of time. A certain degree of like openness to the culture. A lot has been written about that. But I recommend not embarking on continuous deployment with people that you don't like, um, because it's not gonna work for you. Um, <clears throat> you need to have a realistic assessment of the level of risk involved with your process. Like you might say, okay, there's a pretty high risk that we're going to break stuff, but we're a startup, we have 200 users, and we don't care, really care if we break stuff, we can just fail forward. But you might say, we're a bank, we have a requirement for five nines, um, maybe continuous deployment is not for us. Uh, you need to have excellent code review. This is a lot of the time about looking for performance problems and security problems and stuff like that. You need to be really good at source code management, so you can fix stuff if you break it. And you should have lots of tracking and trending and monitoring. Another thing you hear about a lot in the context of continuous deployment is that testing is monitoring, right? It's kind of an interesting idea, so let me talk about this. You should absolutely run your tests against production. The question is though, if you, is there any reason that you shouldn't run your tests continuously? If they don't break anything, if they don't cause excessive load, then you probably should. Um, it's a kind of monitoring. There are, again, sort of people who are really religious about this and saying, I run my test suite against production so I don't need any other kind of monitoring. That's absolutely untrue. Um, because your test suite and your monitoring measure different things, or they should, right? Like your testing will tell you when something is already broken, um, or broken a particular way. It will tell you about things like business logic being broken. Um, like nobody can buy stuff on the site would be a thing that you would get from your monitoring. Um, disk is filling up on the database survey, something you would get from Nagios. Right, so you're looking at different things. Um, and it's okay to have overlap between these two things. If you have, you know, multiple data points about a problem, it lets you triangulate and figure out what the root cause is more easily. So, two final messages that I want to leave you with from this talk. You might say continuous deployment is not for me. I do not have the risk tolerance for it. You know, we're, do we're doing high, we're working in a high trading environment or a hospital, and I don't want to deploy code continuously in case I kill someone or bankrupt a bank. Um, but I think that it is worth these things that I talked about, like the checklist items, the technical stuff and the social stuff, it's worth building out those things, even if you don't want to do continuous deployment. Because automation and a good tool chain and defined process and high levels of trust, all of these things will make your working life a lot easier. So the message is build the capability for continuous deployment, even if you don't ever intend to deploy continuously. And the second thing, which is um, one of the arguments for going to like a high velocity deployment environment or continuous deployment is that really, like with anything else, right, mm -hmm. the only really good way, the only way to get really good at this is to do it a lot. If you only deploy once every six months, it's always going to be hard because it's going to be unfamiliar to you. If you do it once a day, multiple times a day, once a week, 
it becomes like a, a routine and something that you can do almost without thinking about it. You absorb it into your subconscious and then you can just focus on the parts that are hard as opposed to the parts that are routine, using up a lot of your mental bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Questions? If you, yes. So I have to I'm say, in, in the last, <laughs> last two years, at least yeah. thinking of Socorro, your, yeah. your deployment process mm -hmm. has improved immensely. Oh, out of like, sight, yes. Like uh -huh. in the last two years from now and, and today, it's yeah. just night and day. And, and uh, from my perspective, that's a lot to do with everything that you covered yeah. in your presentation. What was, what, in your opinion, what would be like the most influential? The thing one most that, important that, thing. Yeah. Was um, part of that predictability, which actually covers a lot of things, um, but it covers like automation and practice. I think are the two main things that it covers, like knowing what's going to happen because you've tested it um, and done it a lot. We used to, I mean, you know, there were times when, on this project and on previous projects I worked on too, like when I worked on Sumo, um, you know, when we had a deployment, we'd order in dinner and we'd sit down there at seven o'clock to a deployment. We'd be <laughs> expecting to be there till two in the morning, right? Um, and now it's like, <laughs> we deploy in the middle of a meeting a lot of the time, like, oh, can we deploy now? Yeah, okay, let's deploy. That's it. Um, like, it's just no fuss. Um, we only do it once a week, but it's like, a, yeah, let's do that. And then we update a wiki, but we're going to automate that. <laughs> we have a, one of building a release tool to automate like a, um, so we know what versions are like on what servers and stuff. It's the last piece, I think. Other questions? Yes? This is kind of random, but um, for those who don't do continuous integration, so they still check on things through build and there's not an automated test. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. Do you think it is a good practice or no to have some kind of, I think at every single dev team I've ever worked on, there's been some negative consequence for breaking the build. If you're the person who breaks the build, you have a skeleton one on your door or something like that. The dunce hat. Right, right. Yep. <laughs> good practice or bad practice? Oh yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, developer shaming is a powerful tool. Um, wow. It depends a little bit on the person, actually, we're talking about this at lunchtime, because I, it depends on your culture, right? There are some people who, Get, would get utterly mortified by that and it would probably just completely destroy the productivity for the rest of the day. Um, so I think as long as it's jovial, it's okay. Um, you know, like having a hub bot or something that pops up in IRC and says, hey, you broke the bill, I think that's okay. Taking it to the extreme of like hazing and okay, now you have to run around the room with no pants on, that's like too <laughs> um, But um, it depends on the team. You know, I think some teams have kind of like a Sorry, use a cliche, a bro culture, right? Where it's all like, oh, we're all gonna like poke fun at each other, and you're an idiot. And look what look what you did in the code. I can't believe you committed that, you moron. And then other places are like a little nicer. So it's a little bit knowing your company culture, <laughs> um, you know. And I, I know among there's ten people on my team, and I know there are some developers where I could like, especially like if the ego is huge, then you need to shame them a little bit. Like, <laughs> I thought you were this big developer, and you never made those mistakes. And there are other people, and I know if I said that to them, they would be crushed. Right, and it's more like, hey, maybe you should pay a little more attention next time. You know, I'm trying to be nice about it. So it depends. Just to add on to that, yeah. or a funny <laughs> side of it, uh, think he has a toy, which is a USB powered rocket launcher. Yes. Where someone <laughs> actually wrote a plugin to Jenkins mm -hmm. to fire the rocket launcher at the guy who. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, and we actually spent some time getting it to work, but the damn launcher needed some Windows stuff, and we were like, we don't have time for this. Oh, you shit. should get ahead of okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was done in I was done in I was like, oh, boy. Spot yeah. <laughs> that was totally not intended. Great, great. Honestly. Just slipped out. Yeah. I mean, dude, Can't take you anywhere. <laughs> Any other questions? Definitely so. Well, thank you for listening to me ramble. <laughs>